and welcome everybody. Um, I'm Jim Bonesteel. I'm the executive director of the Rensselaer Plateau Alliance, and I am filling in for uh, Alice Howard, who normally would have introduced our speaker. Um, but Alice is in Puerto Rico and informed me via text a little while ago that she is uh, unable to be here uh, because of internet troubles. So I'd like to introduce Ethan Winter. Uh, Ethan is the Senior Community Engagement Manager at Cypress Creek Renewables and has a focus on planning, development, and government relations in support of community and transmission scale solar projects in New York and Massachusetts. And in a, in a prior life, he was the program manager for the Land Trust Alliance in New York State. And um, that's where I know him from, uh, mostly. So welcome, Ethan, and take it away. Hey, thanks, Jim, and uh, Rensselaer Plateau Alliance. Uh, really appreciate this opportunity to connect with all of you. Just want to make sure you all can hear me OK. Give me a thumbs up. Some of you. Great. Um, so we're going to cover a fair amount of ground here um, in the next hour or so. Okay, let me just figure out how to advance this. Are you all seeing my screen? We see it, Ethan. Uh, the arrow keys might work. If, if you're using like the pointer, that can interfere with the clicking. Um, okay. Just one question in terms of how many notes we need to take. Will the slides be available later? Yes, we'll record the, the we could probably, well, it's up to Ethan. We can provide the slides, but we will be, we are recording and that'll be available. Yeah, I'll, I'll clean some things up uh, and get them to everybody. Happy to do that. Um, and a couple caveats here. So, um, I do work for a company that work that develops solar across the country, uh, including in New York. Um, I'm not representing the company tonight. This is really a volunteer opportunity to share uh, some insights. And um, I'm not an electrical engineer. Um, there are a lot of things I don't know. Uh, so I, I, you know, basically have enough experience to be pretty dangerous at this point. Uh, three years into my work uh, as a developer of community solar projects and really hope that this can be uh, a conversation as much as possible. Solar gets um, uh, people, you know, reacting in lots of different ways. We're not going to talk about solar right away. Um, I wanted to set the table a bit uh, on this tour. Um, Alice had asked me to talk about you know, climate trends and climate science. Again, I'm not a scientist, but I do follow this very closely. I know we have folks on the uh, webinar here who uh, certainly can weigh in and offer additional insights. Um, if you're gonna understand the climate trends, you have to understand energy. Um, and that was really what spurred me to get into solar is because I love the land. And I was watching climate change in front of me um, and wanted to understand how to sell for energy as much as I could. New York is leading in many ways on a climate uh, and clean energy policy. So it's important for us to talk about that. And that will lead us to a discussion around solar. Um, and I probably have more material here than we wanna to try to cover, but I thought it would be useful to uh, try to get you in the head of uh, someone who's developing projects and give you some of the vocabulary around these projects because Rensselaer County and the Hudson Valley um, will be seeing uh, solar and is already seeing solar. And um, the more conversant you are in how these projects come together, I, I think the more useful you can be as advocates for good siting and um, you know for, for moving these projects forward. Um, we'll certainly have some time to discuss uh, some of this, the solar issues that are out there. Um, I want to avoid going down too many rabbit holes here, but certainly we'll touch on some of the higher level issues. Um, one area of interest of mine and many others is this concept of dual use solar or agrivoltaics. 
We'll talk about what that means uh, towards the end. Um, and uh, we'll also talk a little bit about natural climate solutions, which is really you know, an important role for land conservation organizations. Um, but the ability of the land to sequester and store carbon is going to be strained by climate change. And so that's why you know, it brings us right back to energy uh, and thinking carefully about that. Um, some of you may have seen a few of these slides before. This is um, really captures the year or so that we've been in. Um, in some ways, the COVID pandemic is a test of what's to come for us. Uh, with climate change, um, we're all going to have to make sacrifices, behavioral changes, um, some radical shifts in how we think about things if we're going to avoid much more dire consequences down the road. Sounds a little bit like what we've been through over the last year with, uh, with COVID. Uh, the difference being that climate change is gonna affect and is already affecting every corner of the planet. And uh, there's no quick fix. There's no vaccine that's gonna get us out of this. Uh, this is gonna be a multi-generational uh, thing that we have to work our way out of. Um, so I think this cartoon really kind of highlights uh, what's before us. And um, if you have any doubts, and this is really sobering, and I wish it weren't true, um, things are really blinking uh, on, the, on the climate dashboard. Uh, last year uh, essentially was the warmest year on record, tying with uh, 2016. And each of the last seven years have been the warmest record uh, on record. So, you know, we're really in a situation here. And another way of thinking about it isn't that these are the warmest years since, you know, some baseline. It's to think that the years we are in now are going to be the coolest years that uh, we'll be talking about to our, our kids and our grandkids. They're going to be inheriting much uh, warmer situations. Um, so think of this as it looks warm now. But these are really the coolest years. And if we're really going to deal with this, um, we have to make fairly drastic steps now um, to, again, flatten the curve. And some of this is going to be uncomfortable for us to really think about. Um, many of you are, are familiar with you know, what's happening with uh, emissions and carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Uh, I think this is worth sharing just because the Mauna Loa data set is so robust and it tells the story uh, so compellingly. When I was putting this together, um, you know, in February, I, I didn't sort of really anticipate what was going to happen in early April, which is that we actually hit 420 parts per million earlier this month for the first time in recorded history. And the COVID pandemic really had only a very modest and basically insignificant effect on um, emissions, as it turns out, as, as far as uh, this data set is concerned. So, you know, again, we are climbing and in the wrong direction. And another way to show this is the slope of uh, carbon dioxide accumulation. You know, we're, we're, again, still pedal to the metal here, guys, um, with, um, in essence, an annual increase of uh, carbon in the atmosphere almost three times what it was in the 60s. So, you know, again, there's a real lag here in terms of emissions and then build up. Um, and the, the carbon that we're talking about now, um, you know, has been building for some time. And this is going to be a very significant bust to turn around. Um, but I think, again, we have to start. We have to start now. And uh, Folks in New York are taking this really seriously, and that's why we're talking so much about solar these days and other renewables. Um, this is the this is the graphic I share with my fourth grader, um, just to help her understand where we're heading. Um, and, and again, it's just if if graphics and statistics aren't your thing, it's pretty easy to see uh, what's happening with uh, our climate. Uh, over time here. And we're, we're going to have to change the colors here 
as we move into um, later years. But the trend is undeniable. Fortunately, I think uh, you know a lot of folks are paying attention. A lot of young people, um, incredible diversity of um, uh, activists and and normal people are are really starting to think about how they can be part of the solution in uh, climate action. I think this is actually a really exciting time, um, and we're starting to hear I think some pretty bold things um, out of the Biden administration as well. Um, so, you know, things are starting to, to perhaps really turn, um, but I do think that the youth are going to be leading this effort as much as anyone else. So let's talk a little bit about what we are um, really facing in terms of the carbon curve here. And I don't know if, I'm hoping everyone can see this okay on the screen. I realize the font is pretty minuscule. The main thing to highlight here is that um, most of you are gonna be very interested in the role that land can play uh, in sequestering carbon, and it is a material impact. Um, however, by far, the most significant thing we can be doing is um, electrifying and greening our electricity. So um, by electrification, I mean um, moving transportation uh, and industry in particular to more uh, electricity-based uh, power and powering with the greenest means possible. And um, that's the big blue here on, on top of the, the graphic here, how we move things down um, to 40% or even 60% of 2010 levels. Um, again, land has an important role to play and, and we're hearing more about the concept of protecting 30% of critical lands by 2030. Um, great and important goal. And I think uh, Rensselaer Plateau Alliance and um, other land conservation groups have a valuable role to play in that. Uh, I, I would just urge uh, all of you to think about how you also promote clean energy and efficiency um, as part of your narrative around the land. Because the two really are the two parts of the coin. So if we're gonna understand energy, it's, it's kind of helpful to understand, you know, what happens when you flip a switch. And, you know, in general across the country, uh, you know, on an average basis, uh, you're getting uh, your power, 62% of the power is coming from fossil fuels. And that's why electricity is uh, over a quarter of um, the greenhouse gas emissions. But again, transportation is a big chunk. Uh, industry is a chunk, agriculture, um, but again, to understand electricity, you want to understand um, the components here. And nationally, renewables account for uh, under 20% of the power. Most of that is um, in wind and hydro. Solar is uh, still under 2%. Um, and what's really interesting is how natural gas has replaced coal just in the last uh, decade or so. So you really, you know, again, Every time you flip a switch, you want to be thinking about and understanding where your, your power is really coming from. Uh, this is a graph that shows New York's power mix. Uh, there's some really good information out there if you're interested in diving in um, from the Energy Information Administration. Uh, they've got uh, incredible data sets and you can really uh, parse this out. Um, in New York, uh, renewables are about 28% of our current power mix. Most of that, 80% of the renewables is hydro. And most of that is coming from um, one particular area, which is the Robert Moses Niagara Hydro Plant in um, Western New York, So, which was built decades ago. So what we're talking about here is a, uh, a really significant push to increase the wind and solar components of our uh, energy mix in New York, and you know, ultimately um, replacing a lot of the natural gas that you see here. It's also worth mentioning that nuclear, um, uh, and folks can really discuss this later, you know, a very important part of our energy mix in New York, but our fleet is aging. Uh, you know, we're already phasing out Indian Point uh, outside of New York City, um, our plants in central New York, 
are being propped up at great expense. So, um, you know, again, there's a good questions about how we, we replace that generation capacity with renewables. Um, it's gonna take a lot. Uh, New York, as I mentioned, is uh, a, really positioning as a leader on clean energy. Um, I'm sure most of you are quite familiar with this and some of you have been probably very involved in this effort. Um, but it was just uh, in 2019 where the state enacted uh, the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act um, and very ambitiously set a target for 70% of the state's electricity to come from renewables by 2030, less than 10 years from now. And again, remember we're at 28% now. Um, and in essence, what it means is an eightfold increase in the solar and uh, wind percentage that we have now and zero carbon emissions uh, from the electricity sector by 2040. That includes nuclear. Um, and all of this is gonna take an enormous investment, um, which we're already starting to see in New York, um, where you know, developers uh, are coming from all over the country and some from within the state to uh, really see this transition. Um, very exciting to see the offshore wind uh, industry starting to really um, develop. Um, you're seeing more and more about that. Um, one of our, our own from Albany is Amanda Lefton, some of you may know, formerly from the Nature Conservancy and uh, the governor's office and now director of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for the Biden administration. And this is a really big deal and very, uh, very exciting. Um, so the goals in the Climate Act are multifold. I just wanted to mention a few, um, nine gigawatts of offshore wind um, obviously, none of that has been built yet, um, but a lot is coming. And big questions about, you know, how do you actually physically get that power to the load centers that are um, on shore, Long Island and Metro New York? Now, the Climate Act also includes uh, three gigawatts of storage, and um, this is key. You know, with storage, uh, we're able to um, uh, really make the best use of renewables. And uh, this technology is moving very quickly. Um, and uh, I think New York, again, is gonna be one of the leaders in the country in, in showing how you compare storage with renewables and make, again, the, the, take the best of, of the renewables um, so that you, you know, you're able to use dispatch that power when you really need it. And storage is the key with that. Uh, my kind of area of focus has been in this uh, so-called distributed PV solar space. Um, that is to say, um, solar that is, uh, whether it's on your rooftop or a community solar um, that is um, utilized locally. Um, there's also transmission scale solar, which utilizes the high voltage lines and is moving bulk power to major load centers like New York City. Um, New York's goal for distributed solar is 6,000 megawatts or six gigawatts by 2025. So four years from now. And what that would mean is, you know, more than a doubling of the current pace of solar development and um, installation um, and about 640 megawatts per year of total um, distributed install power. And an interesting question, again, for, for some of you, you know, interested in land use impacts, um, I was kind of doing a back of the envelope uh, calculation on this. And again, this is, this is my math, so take it with a grain of salt, but just adding 640 megawatts uh, DC, if all of that were on land, um, you'd be looking at about, um, 3,000 acres of, of solar a year, roughly. And, um, you know, that's, that's not an insignificant amount of land for solar, right? Um, but that's, a, that's the kind of pace that we need to be on if we're going to be meeting uh, these, these targets. 
I mentioned the gym, you know, some time ago that if folks are really interested in diving in on this, um, the large scale renewables, that's probably a separate webinar. Um, it's a very important thing for folks to understand that there are different tracks here. Uh, the projects I've been involved in are primarily uh, locally approved community solar, but there's a whole nother class of projects that you're hearing about, uh, the so-called transmission projects, large scale renewables. And these are projects that are typically 25 megawatts and larger. Uh, some of them are hundred megawatts. Some are even multiples of hundred megawatts. Um, potentially. And um, those are the large projects that are really going to move the needle in terms of uh, New York's energy mix over time. But they do have a, a significant footprint on the land. So the Accelerated Renewable Energy Growth and Community Benefit Act, which was passed uh, just a year ago in the state budget, um, really kind of transition the state uh, siting and review and approval process from what was known as Article 10 to 94C. And again, that's something that I, I would encourage if you're interested in learning more about this, you know, have a, have a separate session that really dives into what this involves. Um, but I just wanted to flag that, you know, this is an effort by the state to streamline permitting and approvals and it developed a, an office of renewable energy siting, a standalone office to manage that. Uh, it's still staffing up and they're gonna have a ton of work to do um, with the large scale renewables that are coming their way. Uh, one other aspect to highlight is that uh, this legislation requires a host community benefit um, financial agreement with the hosting jurisdictions. And uh, that's a really important component uh, something I've focused on a lot with the community solar projects, um, but the tax agreements and how these projects are providing, you know, additional financial benefit to the communities that are hosting these projects uh, is really important. Um, you know, if we don't have social acceptance of, of these projects, they're not going to get very far. So I'm just glad to see this, is, you know, included in the um, uh, in the Community Benefit Act here. Um, and much more to come as, as we see you know, more of these projects in the pipeline. Um, none of the large scale solar projects have yet broken ground in New York that I'm aware of, but several have been approved. So circling back here, um, just to highlight again that um, you know, New York is on a track for um, economy-wide decarbonization over the next generation. It's a really tall order. Um, not all states are on such a track, but um, you know, hopefully we can show that it makes economic sense uh, with a lot of public health benefits. Um, and again, where we are here is in that lower right corner is where the, the wind and solar and, and hydro live. And ultimately that's gonna need to replace the orange <laughs> on the top of this graph. So really significant work ahead of us uh, and everyone has a role to play. I warned you earlier, I'm not an electrical engineer, but I thought it might be useful just to talk a little bit about uh, solar technology specifically, um, because again, we're, we're seeing a lot more of it and there are, um, I think some misconceptions around solar, um, but it's something just to highlight, you know, crystalline silicon is, the, is the, the basic essence of a solar cell and, and solar energy, uh, photons are exciting uh, electrons in the in the uh, silicon and um, across the gradient um, that creates a current um, which collects and ultimately you know with an inverter you're converting the direct current to alternating current which is the usable energy that um, you see you know you get out on the lines um, the efficiency of these panels is, is progressing uh, continuously. Um, I have 320 watt panels on my roof at home, um, but the industry is already looking at 450, 500, even you know, 550 watt panels uh, you know, a year or two hence. So uh, the good news is the more efficient these panels are, uh, the more 
uh, energy you can produce on a smaller footprint of land or a rooftop. And uh, that's really good news. Um, and Annie had asked me to talk a little bit about end of life issues. And this is, this is a really important consideration. You know, what, what do we do with these panels at the end of their life? They, they do degrade about a half a percent a year. And um, uh, there are some good questions about how you might repurpose these panels uh, if they're beyond their commercial life. They may still be quite useful um, and very cheap in essence um, for others. Um, if you're gonna recycle the components, um, right now that's still a pretty expensive process. And um, it's gonna take the industry uh, government regulations and incentives um, to really get this right in terms of um, repurposing um, these panels. Most of it is glass in essence, but there are um, trace metals, uh, silver and um, other metals that are in there that have some value. Um, but this comes up a lot in the local zoning meetings I go to, folks ask what's gonna happen to these panels in 40 years? And um, right now we don't have a robust recycling uh, program, but there, there will be one because there's gonna be so much material uh, and we're gonna wanna recapture that. One of the key drivers here, uh, of course, is that solar is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. Uh, and this is, this is really the success story of this technology. Um, some will argue that the uh, declines in cost are um, starting to flatten out, and that's, uh, that's true. Um, there's been about a 90% decline in the cost of solar um, uh, over the last uh, couple decades, and um, there's only so much more we can squeeze out there. Um, but it's why solar is, in essence, the, the cheapest source of bulk energy right now for uh, two thirds of the world's population. Um, and last year, um, solar was uh, the largest uh, single source, solar and wind, were the single sources of, um, largest sources of new energy added to the grid in the United States. And that's a function of market uh, economics, um, not incentives, but you know, the levelized cost of this energy is really competitive now. Um, and it will continue to get cheaper. So something just to flag here um, in terms of the, the cost curves. Um, we're now seeing, you know, of course, solar on rooftops um, and parking canopies. These are the more expensive kinds of uh, solar, um, you know, scale matters, um, but it's something to, to be thinking about, you know, how do you get the most cost effective green energy you can um, and it's going to take an all of the above approach to, to uh, really decarbonize our, our power sector. Um, but encourage everyone to think about solar on their roof. Um, we'll talk a little bit about why that's really difficult, actually, for a lot of people to do that. Um, and again, there are lots of other places where we can put solar uh, that's not in uh, so-called greenfield development, using uh, landfills, uh, brownfields, parking areas, but again, all of that tends to be several times more expensive um, on a kilowatt basis than larger systems. Um, this is a, a couple of photos of projects developed by a company I work for. Um, on the left is a two megawatt community solar project in Canandaigua, and um, one of the earliest projects in central New York to, to do community solar. Um, on the right is a 100 megawatt project in South Carolina. Uh, and again, you can see the, the differences in scale. Um, and it's an important question, you know, you wanna sort of concentrate your, your solar power plants in a particular area, um, or do you have a really distributed model where you've got lots of community solar, let's say a couple, three or four or five in every county. Um, and it really isn't a matter of one or the other, you're gonna need both. Um, but the key distinction here is that the community solar stays, that energy is, is utilized locally, um, whereas the large transmission projects are producing bulk power that uh, is moved on high voltage lines to um, 
you know, a significant load center. Um, just to kind of get your head into, you know, what it takes to put these projects together. Um, this is a very simplified six step process for how you put a, you know, how you develop a project. Um, but the, the key thing I wanted to flag here, um, which we'll dive into is um, that the interconnection um, is as much of a resource as in some ways as the solar itself. And this is one thing I wanna flag here. So there are you know, any number of complex uh, factors that go into developing a solar project. This is just a short list of uh, things that you know, as a developer you're thinking about. Obviously the site is paramount. Uh, you're, as you know, looking for uh, reasonably flat places um, that have favorable topography and absence of wetlands. Uh, the interconnection, which we'll talk a little bit more about, um, is essential because you need a place to plug um, the power into and move it. Um, and those ex the expenses of interconnection can go up very quickly um, if you're farther away. One thing that I want to flag too is landowner interest. Um, you know, a lot of landowners are quite interested in participating in solar, and um, it doesn't happen just like land conservation doesn't happen without landowners being interested in this. Um, once you have a, a site and you've got confirmation of interconnection capabilities, and you've got landowners who are interested, and you transition into really designing a project that's going to fit in that space. Um, and you're thinking about the equipment mix, whether you're using a fixed tilt system or trackers, whether you're including a battery. Um, and of course, all of this runs through the local ordinances and the local solar code, um, presuming the town has a code. Um, most towns in New York have developed some uh, goalposts for this. And then you're running all of this through uh, your agency approvals uh, which are uh, quite extensive and the secret process. Um, one other really important factor is the, you know, how these projects are taxed and assessed um, and whether or not you're gonna be able to have a payment lieu of tax agreement instead of ad valorem taxation. Really important issue because most assessors don't uh, have comfort assessing these solar farms uh, and that can be a very significant risk if you're developing and not knowing what kind of property tax burden you're going to have. Um, the other thing I'll mention is, you know, the O&M is really important, uh, thinking about how you're maintaining screening, uh, ground management, uh, pollinators, uh, potentially even having um, animals like sheep uh, helping to graze, really important parts of your, your project design. And then, you know, ultimately decommissioning uh, and having uh, most towns with solar codes have a clear de decommissioning requirement where that's bonded. Um, you know, there's some sort of surety that um, is a guarantee that there will be resources to uh, restore that site uh, if for some reason the, the owner of that project is not able to do that. So linking back a little bit, you know, it's really important to think about how solar uh, gets uh, to the grid. And um, we work with multiple utilities in New York. Each one is kind of a, a different animal. Um, you all with the Rensselaer Plateau Alliance primarily working with National Grid, although um, NYSEG has um, some activity and service area where you are as well. And I pulled this up the other day. This is a, a picture of the host capacity map for National Grid uh, for Eagle Mills uh, in uh, Rensselaer County. And you'll notice right in the middle of this picture is a solar farm. Um, the, the blue lines here have more capacity to move power. And um, it's you know, a good reason why that solar farm is where it is. Um, but again, the, the interconnection is essential. And typically the developers of these projects are paying for that upgrade, whether it's extending three phase line or um, reconducting the lines uh, to handle additional power. And the other thing that you have to be aware of is the substation um, and its capacity to handle more. 
those are very significant upgrades, um, often running um, into the um, low millions uh, sometimes. And it can be a binary factor in terms of whether you can build a project or not, is you know, what the utility is requiring for uh, that, that capital upgrade. But one thing to think about is the more solar you have, the more investment has been made in that local grid of yours. And, and that is a, a real improvement in terms of reliability and resilience in your, in your local power system. This is a kind of a, a quick look at, you know, what um, is involved in a five megawatt project. Um, and, and I think I'll go pretty quickly here, but uh, important to just understand the, the components here, uh, the panels, the fences, uh, the screening along the public road, all of those are, you know, very thoughtful elements of a project where the community in the uh, approval process has a role to play uh, in expressing, you know, interest around you know, project design. So I would encourage everyone to participate if you're aware of projects that are happening in your area, uh, attend the planning board meetings. Um, you, you can really have an influence and, in, you know, how these projects are uh, developed and, and um, how they look ultimately. So looking back at New York, um, we are a top 10 state in solar at this point, which is great, um, but we're nothing compared to Texas and California, big states with a lot of sunshine. Um, just really interesting to think that uh, in the last uh, couple of years, uh, New York added 500 megawatts of solar. Um, Texas and California in the last year each added six times that. Um, so it's or five times that. So um, we have we have a lot of room to grow, so to speak, in the solar world. Um, and community solar has been really the success story uh, for New York. Um, this is actually a picture in Saratoga County, one of the first projects developed um, in the Hudson Valley uh, in Half Moon. And um, what community solar is all about is uh, in essence, it allows people who have, you know, a technical or ownership or financial uh, challenge in, in putting PV on their own roof, uh, allows them to benefit from solar uh, that's offsite. Uh, it's an ingenious idea, um, really pioneered in Minnesota um, and uh, Massachusetts and, and now a cornerstone of New York's energy program. 80% um, of US households for various reasons are unable to put uh, solar on their own roof. So uh, community solar really provides equity of access um, and in some ways a more democratic approach to clean energy um, than you know, those who are fortunate enough to have a roof and be able to put um, money uh, into the, that system. So, uh, Many of you have probably seen uh, solicitations for community solar in your area, um, and that's and that's why it really allows you to reap the benefits of solar uh, without having to put it on on your own roof. Uh, as I mentioned, New York has been a leader in this. Um, almost ninety percent of all the community solar in New York has been placed into service in just the last two years, um, and there's a lot more coming. Um, with uh, projects that have been under development for the last couple of years. And there's an enormous queue of projects in um, you know, requesting interconnection with utilities across the state, almost 5,000 megawatts. Um, you know, there will certainly be attrition. That doesn't mean all of that will be developed, um, but it does mean that you know, we're gonna see more of these projects and really understanding what they're for you know, helps you, I think, appreciate um, you know, what they are. This is local power um, offered at a discount, um, and and, the, and the, again the energy stays right there uh, in in the area. So pretty exciting stuff uh, in terms of the the wave that's that's happening here in community solar, and something I've been excited to be part of. I think I'll move pretty quickly on this, but this is a, a graph from a uh, organization called the Acadia Center that's really mapped out how much 
solar and wind would we need to actually achieve the stated goals that uh, the states in the Northeast have? And it's an enormous number. Um, ultimately, almost 36 gigawatts of wind and solar, uh, or just, I'm sorry, just solar would be needed um, to meet the goals across the whole region. Um, and it, it's a sobering thing if that were all on land, um, it would be in the neighborhood of 170,000 acres of solar um, across, you know, from Maine to New York. Uh, that's a big chunk of land, about the size of Putnam County. Um, but again, think about what that would achieve. It would allow um, for uh, these states to, in essence, decarbonize. And, and this is the kind of thing that we're gonna have to really think about if we're serious about meeting these climate goals. So how do we integrate this concept of solar uh, on the land uh, in a way that works? Um, in the last few slides here, I just wanna highlight this. You know, there are um, a lot of good reasons to think about how solar can be part of a working landscape and not in opposition to farming, but supporting farming, um, particularly where these are in more rural areas. Um, these are two projects that Cypress Creek Renewables developed on farms. Um, and these were, uh, you know, considered part of the, the business model of the farm was finding some acreage uh, for these two megawatt community solar facilities while enabling uh, the farm to, to operate and thrive uh, on its own. There has been, you know, a lot of discussion about what's happening with the farm economy in New York. Um, dairy has been really tough for quite a while. And uh, I think there's a there's a valuable conversation to be had around how solar can support uh, farming in a way that um, that is compatible. Uh, and this is an issue that gets uh, you know different people you know reacting in very strong ways, for and against. Um, and certainly look forward to some discussion with the group here. But there are um, I've been in a number of uh, you know barns with dairy farmers who are telling me, boy, I would just love to give you 40 acres so I can actually keep farming and have something to pass down to my kids because dairy is, is just not, not doing it for me. And I don't wanna see houses. Uh, I don't wanna see it developed in a way that um, really uh, converts the land permanently. So done right, solar can in some ways bank this land if it's done uh, really well you could even rebuild uh, and strengthen the, the soils over time. And that's really the cutting edge in, in all of this uh, is thinking about the concept of agrivoltaics or dual use solar, uh, you know, an intentional approach to combining the best of land management with uh, solar. And uh, some projects around New York are, are already experimenting with this. Um, poultry, sheep uh, tend to work the best. Um, other developers are looking at uh, native grassland restoration and prairies um, and pollinator plantings as a way to both uh, streamline their, their maintenance costs because um, you don't have to mow this and you don't mow it very much. Um, and it really builds the this, this soil carbon over time. So I think this is really a, an exciting space to to um, be thinking about um, and ultimately it can improve the social acceptance of these projects knowing that there's um, some kind of farming activity and um, ecological enhancement that's happening in and around these projects. I'm gonna wrap up here with uh, just a, a thought on natural climate solutions. So, uh, you know, we hear a lot about, again, the important role that land conservation uh, has to have in, um, in all of this. So the natural climate solutions approach is, is really putting some metrics around the green on this graph. How much uh, can terrestrial ecosystems sequester carbon? Uh, it's an important part of what we're trying to do here in terms of staying below two degrees Celsius. Um, however, all of the gray above it is fossil fuel mitigation. It's, it's moving 
our, um, our, our whole approach to energy to wind, solar, and storage. And the natural climate solutions approach unravels a bit if <clears throat> um, these uh, forest systems and grasslands get stressed due to climate change. And we're already starting to see that happen, uh, unfortunately, that recent study just came out looking at the Amazon um, and there appears to be some strong signals that the Amazon is starting to tip to uh, potentially a net source of greenhouse gases and happening much sooner than people thought was possible. So this the natural climate solutions piece is really important, but it's fragile. And the best way to support it is uh, through you know, really aggressive fossil fuel mitigation. I think I'll just uh, move quickly on this, but this highlights what I was just saying that um, the ability of uh, natural landscapes to sequester carbon uh, appears to be declining. Uh, it's, it's really a factor of diminishing returns and you know, you, you're limited by nutrients and water. Um, so there's only so much upside in terms of CO2 fertilization. Um, again, all of that points to uh, us not being able to rely on our forests and our natural ecosystems to, to get us out of the carbon uh, dilemma that we're in. We really do need to focus on uh, the energy side of this equation. And I'll leave you with this. Um, we're um, all aware of, of the changes that are in front of us. And um, I just thought it was fascinating to think about, you know, the long-term monitoring of uh, cherry blossoms in, in Japan and 1200 years of, of watching um, every spring, these beautiful blossoms come out. And in March, um, it was widely noted that um, they came out earlier than they had ever seen before. So the natural systems are responding in real time right before our eyes. And um, again, just underscores how important it is for us to be uh, thinking really, really ambitiously and out of the box about how we're gonna move to a, a decarbonized uh, energy system and really start making uh, major changes in, in, in our consumption and our purchasing um, and everything we do. Jim, I think I'm going to leave it at that. We've covered an awful lot of ground here in the past uh, 15 minutes or so. So I will um, invite conversation. Thank you. Great. Th thanks, Ethan. Um, that was awesome. Um, there are a number of questions in the chat, so um, I'll, I'll go through them uh, in chronological order. Um, the first one is, I don't think you'll, you'll have anything uh, for it's what's the status of the flywheel storage of the flywheel storage facility in Steventown. So assuming that you wouldn't know anything about that, I posted a few links to, on things that I could find. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I don't know. If I can offer much, there, there is a it's a forty megawatt facility, and it's flywheels that that spin up on off hours and and can uh, can handle like dips in in or uh, surges in in load, and I think it's just to, to flatten out the the um, the peaks and valleys when when there's a demand or a sudden demand. I don't know enough about it. Um, I know they're having some troubles um, at one point, but from the links, it looks like it might be up and running and going. So, so uh, there are some very creative energy storage uh, techniques out there. They're not all battery. Uh, and I've been paying attention to one in the Adirondacks that's looking at utilizing some old mines near Lake Champlain. Um, unfortunately, some of them are um, really uh, important a habitat for the bats. So, you know, again, some very challenging trade-offs here. Um, and it certainly doesn't mean that you're, you're putting everything everywhere. You do have to make some choices. Okay, the next one is a comment from Judy. Um, 
noting that it's important to note that um, natural gas poisons the water in a big way. Um, and this was in response when you were talking about um, the recycling of the materials and the pushback on <laughs> what will happen. So, you know, everyone asks the questions about, um, about solar and the life cycle, but, um, but people aren't, aren't saying that, you know, aren't, aren't asking the questions about coal and oil and gas, um, which um, I, I'm paraphrasing Judy's, but mm -hmm. um, which are, you know, have issues of their own. And, and so she thinks we need to reframe the discussion there. You want to comment on that or I'll go on to the next? Uh, I, well, I certainly agree with Judy. Um, solar is new and so you know, it, it gets and deserves a lot of questions. Um, but we absolutely need to ask what, what are the externalities of, uh, you know, the other things that we take for granted. Um, just think about the nuclear waste, um, or, or again, obviously the externalities of, uh, of our fossil fuel use. So um, it's, it's a valid point. I, I, I'm quite confident that there will be, um, you know, reasonable measures to make sure that, you know, we're, we're not dumping millions of panels in a landfill. Um, ultimately, you know, it's, it's going to be worth um, recycling that. But right now, it's not. And that's a function of R&D and a function of thinking about how you're maybe adding into the price of the panels a reclamation fee, just as you do with your cans and bottles, so that um, manufacturers have an incentive to reclaim uh, as much of the components as they can. All right. Um, Maria asks, are hosting capacity aerial maps available for land trusts? to use for analysis for our conservation planning? Yeah, so the um, that's a great question, Maria. The hosting capacity map that I showed earlier is um, something that anyone can access. It's a public. Um, you have to register with some of the, um, the portals. Uh, some of the utilities just like to know who's getting in there. Um, but for National Grid, it's pretty straightforward. And, um, you can see, you know, they update it periodically. You can see what the, the, the feeders look like, the substations. Um, and I would say that it's useful. It's not necessarily entirely predictive in terms of where you might see solar. But um, typically the first place that, uh, you know, solar developers are gonna be looking for is, you know, a place that has um, some capacity. The, the reality right now is, there are a number of places in the state that had capacity and now, you know, there's a lot of projects that may be in that particular region. And there's an important question as to who's gonna share the costs for those upgrades, you know, whether it's across different projects or what have you. And uh, that's something that is gonna be worked out uh, with the state and with the utilities and it has to because, um, you know, otherwise you end up with a real bottleneck of um, you know a pipeline of projects that, that really can't get uh, onto the grid. Massachusetts had this issue where they opened up a lot uh, for solar, and then very quickly the utilities got swamped. Now they're trying to fix that. Yes, those maps are public, and um, if you if you just Google National Grid hosting capacity map um, and register, you should be able to access. And I bet Mike Horn would probably be a good person to navigate that. All right, thanks, Ethan. Um, Richard comments that community solar is confusing regarding cost and billing. We signed up last year, but backed out due to confusion about benefits and costs. Yeah, it's a great point, uh, Richard. Uh, the state has passed a consolidated billing measure that uh, should put that on one bill. Um, it can be confusing to get two different bills and to try to reconcile that. So there have been uh, measures to try to put all that on, again, one bill so that you know what your credit is and you don't have to compare statements. 
right, and Michelle says that she's at a sorority house uh, with girls gone in the summer. How will this affect use of solar? I'm not sure I understand the question, but it sounds interesting. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, yeah, I, I'm thinking, you know, energy use uh, is, there's more energy use during part of the year and then and then not much the rest. So, so maybe this is uh, talking about putting the, you know, I, I don't know. Oh, I get it. Uh, so let's say the sorority house has solar on it. Right. Um, you know, the uh, the way it currently works, is, uh, you know, there's just kind of a net metering approach and uh, there might not be anyone there in the summer, but you're accumulating those credits and you'll use them in the winter. So, um, you know, it might be, a, it might be a wash at the end of the day. Okay, and Elaine um, says that uh, I too am confused about residential participation in community solar and billing and recently received a letter about it from the county exec, but found it was hard to understand how it worked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the, I, the concept for community solar is that um, you're subscribing to a, uh, an amount of power that's equal to your your usage, um, and uh, ultimately you're getting, the way the systems are built, uh, about a 10% discount on your uh, on your bill uh, versus prevailing uh, rates. And again, if you've got consolidated billing um, with your community uh, solar provider, then um, all of that shows up on your national grid bill, uh, as opposed to you know, different pieces of, um, of mail. Um, but, and I did read actually that uh, Rensselaer County uh, itself has just uh, subscribed um, its, um, its load to um, a, a project or a, a portfolio of projects. And it's gonna save, you know, a significant amount of money over, over time by doing that. Maybe one of the first county governments that's really done this in New York. Um, so Bonnie, Bonnie's asking um, if, if we can just ask our questions live. And, and I guess what I'll say is I really like um, the chat because everyone gets to ask a question and they, you know, you, their questions are answered in order. But Bonnie, when we come, if, if you feel like, if anyone feels like they um, could articulate their question better uh, by unmuting, then I can invite you to unmute when we get to you. You can just state that in chat. Hey, I'd like to speak and we'll let you do that. Um, but uh, next question is, is it more uh, by, from Kara, is it more effective if a homeowner can do individual solar on the property or to connect with a community project? Jim, could you um, say the question again? I'm sorry. Catch the line. I think she's asking um, what, What's more, uh, it might be more cost effective, uh, but more effective uh, solar on your home uh, as an individual, you know, lay, uh, homeowner, or or would it be better to connect to a community solar project? So it, again, if your roof can handle it, uh, if you don't have the shading, if um, you're willing to put up the, uh, the upfront expense um, and you can finance these things at, at you know, really favorable rates. If you're willing to make that that leap, and, and again, you have the, the the roof and the solar resource to do it. Um, you know, it's much higher return to 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 do the solar uh, your own. But again, it turns out that's that's um, quite limited in terms of um, you know how how many people can really do that on their own roof. A lot of people don't have a house that they own, right? Uh, they're renters or what have you. So Community solar uh, really provides a, an opportunity for uh, the masses to benefit from solar. Um, but if you're able to um, uh, get a, a, an estimate for your own roof, uh, typically these will pay off in uh, six to eight years. And these are systems that last 25 years. So 
you know, after that, you know, your, your power is basically free uh, other than the service delivery fee that the utility will, will charge you. There are state and federal uh, tax credits. Uh, the, the federal investment tax credit has, has been uh, extended, I think. Um, I haven't been paying that much attention to it, but I think that happened. So, um, you know, there are good incentives and, you know, the sooner you do it, um, the better the incentives. Um, you know, I think recently, if you were doing this, uh, you could get tax credits for almost half of the upfront cost. So that, that made your return on investment that much more, again, if you have the roof. Um, and a number of communities are streamlining the permitting for rooftop solar. So it's a very simple permitting process uh, with a, you know, uniform, uh, solar code that allows for that. Um, and so, some communities have actually done what's called a solarized campaign. Saratoga Springs did this, where uh, for a period of time, they were um, working with installers who um, were going to do a number of projects in the community uh, and get even more uh, kind of a discount in terms of um, what that was going to cost because they were working on many homes and businesses in an area. So, you know, again, if you can do it, um, you should do it. Um, but, you know, a lot, a lot of people can't for, for good reasons and that's where the community solar works well. All right. Um, and Mike asks, how far from a population center is it feasible to site a two megawatt solar farm? Uh, you know, so two megawatts of solar, uh, is is probably 10 or 12 acres of uh, footprint. Um, you can see those kinds of projects in urban and suburban areas, you know, right in a population center. There's there's really no public health risk with having a solar project um, you know, near where people live. Usually folks want to have a some kind of buffer or screen around it. Um, but there, there isn't any like public health reason why you need to be distanced from people. The, some people ask about electromagnetic um, radiation uh, and, and that's um, really not an issue there. Um, where the transformers and inverters are typically in the interior of the projects and um, there's no sound or uh, EMFs that are gonna impact people on the outside of the project. Ethan, I got distracted by looking at your next question. Did you did you answer like how far is it? How far away would it be feasible to transmit from that community? In your answer just then. Oh, I, maybe I misunderstood the question. How far from a population center is feasible to site? In other words, so I think he's looking. Yeah, you know, how far away can it be, and the power can still get there? Yeah. Um, so this is, you know, a little confusing. But where you have a community solar project. Um, you know, it's it's distributing to the to the local grid, and you not necessarily if you're subscribing to a community solar system, you're not getting those electrons. They're kind of fungible, if that makes sense. So um, the solar farms are contributing power to the distribution grid, and you're getting a credit for that. But you're not you're not sort of getting those electrons exactly. So um, you know. The key is how far away is the interconnection? And if you've got a three phase right there, um, you know, it, your population center can be, you know, far away. It doesn't, you know, it can be another part of the county and that's okay. The, the way things are working right now in New York is uh, you have to subscribe to a community solar farm that's in the same utility zone. So National Grid is a pretty big utility zone. Typically the subscribers will be recruited close to the system and, you know, they try to get it as close as they can, but it doesn't have to be, just has to be in the same utility. Um, now, I think I'm, I moved very quickly through my slides, but there's a very important issue, which is that, you know, most New Yorkers live downstate and don't have access through their utility to community solar. Um, you know, Con Ed customers have a very limited amount of community solar relative to uh, those of us who live in upstate New York and are serviced by National Grid or uh, NYSEG or some of the other um, upstate utilities. So this is, a, you know, this is a real equity issue. We've got actually a lot of community solar up here 
but the population center in, in New York City um, can't access that unless you have what's known as you know cross utility uh, crediting, and that's something that uh, people in Albany are really talking about. You really force the utilities to allow for um, you know customers in New York City to be able to, in essence, subscribe to a solar farm in uh, the Hudson Valley or even farther away. All right. Um, Bonnie comments that Vermont has land use laws to prohibit solar farms on ag land. At UVM, they're working on working with panels that can be mounted straight up that will serve as fences on ag land. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, it does touch on the, the issue of, um, you know, trying to preserve, you know, the, the most important um, productive soils. Um, in New York, uh, there are a number of communities that have restricted in their solar code, um, the kinds of uh, soil or, or farmland classification that you can develop on. Uh, and if it's in an agricultural zone, they might limit the lot, um, lot coverage ratio and things like that. So, you know, there are things that local jurisdictions can do. Um, the state has not prohibited that uh, per se, but Massachusetts has done that. Um, and and you, I think it's very, you know, it's not a good idea to be trying to put solar um, on land that's been permanently protected under, you know, a conservation easement, you know, typically that doesn't work with the easement anyways. Um, but I think it's an important issue um, there is a process in New York. If, if the solar is on, a, on land that's in an ag district, you go through a notice of intent process with ag and markets. And uh, that agency does require certain standards for construction and remediation. Uh, if you're going to be um, on you know, prime soils and uh, if you're impacting more than 35 acres on a project. Uh, this is a new standard that came out, I think last summer, or last fall, um, then you'll have to commit to a mitigation uh, um, sort of formula that's based on, you know, how much of that land you're impacting. So there, there is a mitigation regime in New York on this and, um, but not a prohibition. Great. Um, Don uh, comments that he recently built a solar carport in South Troy designed by TAP, Troy Architectural Program. And if anybody wants to know about it, they can look in the chat uh, for his email and contact him by email. And the next question comes from Bonnie. And I know Bonnie asked earlier if she could ask her question live. So um, Bonnie, I'll, I'll give you an opportunity to unmute ask if you'd like to do that. Jim, it's all right. I already typed them all in the chat. No worries. Uh, okay. <laughs> all right. Good enough. Um, so uh, how does a landowner know if a person approaching them to rent their land for a farm is legit? I'm told some companies are tying up lands with rental contracts with no intention to build as a way to force out competitive Well, I will say there's there's lots of competition out there um, for good good sites. I, I don't know of uh, folks who are doing that just you know kind of for sport. Um, if you want to know if a company's legit, um, you know certainly you're looking at um, their track record. Um, you know, asking them if if they have. Uh, projects that they've been able to develop, if they have references that they can um, share with you in terms of landowners that they've worked with, um, that's essential uh, if you really want to dig into it. Um, and, you know, understanding, um, you know, where, the, where else the company works. Um, there are, um, in some cases, you've got folks who are acting as a middleman, so to speak, and uh, they may be trying to line up leases uh, for for developers. And in that case, you know, there's there's a bit of separation between you know, someone knocking on your door and the actual company that might end up holding the lease. And you, you want to look, you know, look carefully at that to make sure, you know, you know what you're signing up for. Um, 
more and more there are um, attorneys in, in communities who have experience looking at um, ground mounted solar leases and would certainly encourage everyone if you're interested in doing this to make sure you have an attorney looking at, uh, at that lease. Um, they are negotiable and uh, you should always you know, have someone with some expertise looking at these and helping you understand the terms. So Jeff asked a question um, that I've wondered about, and, and I'm sure there are issues in doing this, but he asks how many acres of shopping mall and warehouse roof are there in New York State? And, and this would be a better location for solar than farmland. So I don't disagree with that at all. Um, you know, rooftop solar is more tends to be uh, more expensive than a uh, greenfield development, but that doesn't necessarily excuse it. Uh, I, I drive around Orange County a lot. Um, enormous warehouses that are on, you know, totally covered up the land, whatever was there before. And um, I don't know because I'm not on the roof, but I'm assuming that most of them do not yet have commercial um, or industrial, you know, solar systems on the roof. Um, and I think that should be, you know, something that uh, local governments should require in their zoning. You know, if you have a warehouse of a certain size, um, it's, you know, it should be um, part of the building code. Um, you know, unfortunately, you know, when you're when you're developing solar, you're dealing with the um, kind of the rules of the road as they are, um, and you work with that. But I, I think incentives to to have the large warehouses. You know, more or less required to do that is a great idea. Yeah. Right. Um, Bonnie asked, how do we get our towns on board with building a community solar farm? You know, have them talk to uh, the, the uh, city of New Paltz um, and Kingston. Um, there are a number of uh, communities in the Hudson Valley that have uh, done RFPs for solar on uh, landfills. Uh, Saratoga Springs has done this. And you know, getting a competitive bid process uh, allows you, you know, and of course that's what they would do. Um, but it, you know, finding out what town lands are actually available, if they're and if they're again going to meet the needs for a solar facility. But more and more local governments are realizing this is uh, an opportunity to reduce costs and um, and and potentially. Um, uh, very significantly. So um, New Paltz right now is doing a, an RFP on, um, on their landfill. I know that's because we've gotten several, uh, you know, their solicitations there. Um, so I would just encourage your, um, your town officials to um, look at other towns that have done this. Um, the um, Climate Smart Communities uh, Registry is, is one place to start in terms of looking at towns that have done this well. Uh, Julia asks, what are your considerations regarding the pollution created from the mining of the silicon needed to create the panels? Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a good question. Um, and, uh, you know, our energy use is not without impact. Uh, the silicon is, I mean, it's basically, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's a very pure uh, material. Um, it does have to come from someplace. Uh, they are looking at ways to uh, repurpose that silicon after um, you're done with the, the solar, um, turning it into other forms of industrial uh, product. Um, and I, I'm not that familiar with the, with the um, pollution or, or mining impacts of silicon per se. Um, I think we have to be really aware of, you know, the alternatives here. So, you know, what about the natural gas in New York? 37% of our power in New York is powered by natural gas, which comes from other states largely. So that's someone else's backyard that, that uh, has been fracked and uh, we're enjoying that natural gas. Um, so I think about the, you know, this is about alternatives. It's not about necessarily you know, solar um, being impact free. And, and I think it's our responsibility to make solar as least impact as it can be. 
Um, but you know, our energy use has impacts and we have to be aware of that. It's a good question. Uh, Mike asks, in agriculture communities within small populations, would NYSEG or National Grid invest for community solar farms? Uh, well, so I will say that most of the community solar in New York is in National Grid and NYSEG territories. Um, the strong majority of, of the projects that are in operation. There's almost 400 community solar farms in operation in New York right now. I'm sorry, I had to move so quickly through those slides. Um, and of those 400, uh, again, most of them are in NYSEG and National Grid territory with uh, Central Hudson, um, you know, having a smaller piece. But yeah, that, that is happening now. Now the utilities aren't investing in the community solar per se, they're kind of accommodating it. And, um, you know, we work very closely with the utilities because, you know, ultimately we're um, adding, adding power to, to the grid that they're managing. So Ethan, it's 8.20. There are still more questions in the queue, <laughs> like five or six. Um, okay. Do you want to keep going or do you? Well, I, you know, I, I, this, is, uh, this is up to you, Jim, and, and everyone who's on the call. If people want to talk a little bit more, I'm happy to stay on for a few more. Yeah, sure. I'm, I'm happy to stick around and, and I suppose folks can sign off as they, as they need to go, so. Um, Jim asks, rather than walking us through the convoluted billing, can you just comment on whether we should expect to pay a little less or a little more per year on community solar as compared to conventional natural grid? Yeah, and I'm, that's a great question, and I should have been even more clear. The state requires that there be a discount for community solar subscribers, so you will pay less. Um, I think that the state requirement is 5%. Most uh, community solar projects are, are designed to target 10% savings. All right. And James asked, do you know any examples where property owners and solar developers see desirable ways to work with land trusts on long-term or end-of-life conservation easements? This could help preserve ag soil for future reuse. Uh, who asked that? That Mr. Savinsky? It was, yeah. There you go. Uh, well, I mean, that really is, um, Jim. That's the rub. Like, let's let's figure this out. <laughs> I think it's it's a great concept, and uh, it's going to make us think, you know, really differently about what long term conservation is all about. Um, if we can uh, think really long-term, uh, these projects may be borrowing the land for 20 to 30 years. Um, you know, we don't really know what kind of energy uh, we're gonna have available uh, a generation or two from now. Uh, and the nice thing about solar is in general, you're using posts, you're, you're, the racking goes straight into the ground and then it comes straight out. Um, and so, you know, unless you're using concrete footers which most of these projects are not, unless um, there's some real reason to. Um, now on landfills, you will have to be on some kind of footer, so you're not puncturing uh, the surface of the landfill, that's different. But if you're in a field, you're typically uh, tapping those posts straight in and they come straight out. And um, if you've managed the site well, you have your land back. Um, I've not seen evidence, and sometimes this does come up in zoning meetings, People ask if um, these these systems are leaching uh, toxic material or uh, heavy metals into the ground. Uh, I haven't seen any studies indicating that that happens. Um, it should not happen because um, everything is contained within the the solar cell itself, which is a glass sandwich. Uh, so you should have productive land. In some ways, this is a way to fallow land. Um, very interesting study, which I could share, Jim, with everyone after this, that looked at, it was a model, that looked at 30 community solar uh, facilities 
in the Midwest that are now in commodity, the, the land was commodity agriculture, so row crops. And they modeled what would be the ecosystem services benefits uh, of, those, of that land if you took it out of, in essence, commodity agriculture and moved it into solar. Um, and sort of conventional solar with turf grass versus what I'll call solar plus with, you know, um, grassland restoration techniques. And what they found is even turf grass uh, replacing uh, commodity agriculture had, had real benefits in terms of uh, the soil. But if you go a bit farther and you're really talking about native grassland restoration uh, around the arrays, you have enormous benefits. Uh, and uh, that I think would be a cool place for land trust to get more involved. Yeah, that's great. You're going to share that you said? That's yep. Yep, okay. be happy to. I just it just came out last month. Thanks. All right, and Judy asks, can you talk again about how solar can help support farm viability? Uh, we lost 2,000 dairy farms in five years. Yeah, what I hear um, from farmers is, you know, if they have the land base, um, this, this allows for diversification. Um, uh, typically, a way a lease works is it's, you know, it's annual income with a, an annual escalator that, that sort of follows with um, inflation. So, you know, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars a year for a farmer um, with all the property taxes on that solar ground being paid for by the project operator it means that you know you now have some real ballast as a as a farmer financially. Um, it does mean that you're not farming that 40 acres anymore. Um, instead, you know, you're lending it for solar, but you now have the ability to, um, you know, have, um, you know, some, some financial means to weather, you know, whatever, whatever else happens on the farm. Um, I think Judy's question is also getting at, you know, how can we really integrate even more agricultural activity within the systems that um, and that's something that, that um, I think a lot of folks are looking at. If you're interested in learning more about this, check out an organization that uh, was founded in New York. It's called the American Solar Grazing Association, ASGA. And uh, they're uh, a terrific organization, very entrepreneurial, looking at you know, how uh, sheep grazers can participate in a meaningful way and uh, helping to take care of these projects. And you know, build uh, you know that that part of um, the farming sector. And some really creative work happening there. Uh, the next one's from Richard, and and I'm not sure if this was a statement in response to something that was said earlier, but um, he says NYSEG customer in Steventown could benefit from community solar in Western New York. And that it might just be a comment when you were talking about the. Um, you know, buying the buying the service, not the electrons. I don't know. So okay, um, and Mike and, and Richard, if if you had something else in mind, just let let me know. Um, yeah, Mike, yeah. I would just say, Jim, there there are probably nice egg, um solar farms that are much closer to Steventown than. Oh, gotcha. Right. It was nice egg versus National Grid kind of. Yeah. 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 Uh, Mike asks, does Cypress Creek uh, pair up uh, farmers with landowners for agrivoltaics? Yeah, that's not something, um, you know, we, my understanding is Cypress Creek has done uh, some sheep grazing experimentally um, in North Carolina where um, we have a lot of activity. Um, something I'm really encouraging, I frankly think it's the future of solar. Um, we, we're we're going to be needing to think a lot more about how to integrate this. Um, but it hasn't been something that, that we've really operationalized that much um, at Cyprus. And I would like to see more, frankly, but um, the, you know, we have to get beyond some of the concerns around liability uh, and sort of the complexities involved in um, agrivoltaics. Um, and um, there's actually another study, Jim, I'll, I'll send it with you all that really gets at this. Kind of developer perceptions around agrivoltaics 
and how to overcome uh, some of those considerations. Thank right. you. Um, and uh, Ethan, Judy um, made a statement that there are a few land trusts who are putting easements on land with solar now. And you can check that out at her website, uh, communityconsultants.com. And that is, I think, um, I, the last question. There were a lot of people that, some people that have gone and have expressed their thanks. Uh, a, lot, a lot of comments about how great the, the presentation was. Um, and I thought, I just removed you from, I had you spotlighted so only you'd show up, Ethan, but I removed that um, just in case Judy wanted to say something um, in relation to that, or and then we can wrap up, I suppose. So a uh, great, absolutely great presentation. And this is, I think, one of the most, the liveliest discussions that we've had after, after one of these lectures. So it's really excellent. Well, I, thank you. I um, was Judy's been a great um, mentor and advisor for me in thinking this through. Um, you know, this this idea of making solar um, better, and um, her website and her e news is a great resource that I would encourage everyone to um, learn about. Okay. Well, thank you, Ethan. Really appreciate you taking the time to be with us tonight. Um, I think everybody enjoyed it, so. Well, uh, appreciate the opportunity and uh, I will uh, get this deck to you and a couple of these articles to share and um, more to come. But again, thanks everybody. Have a great night. Okay, yep, take care.